The Deportee's Tale, as told to Aveus Mohammed. It was three o'clock, he said, a.m. He would have known. Sleepless heads bob perfectly with each strike of the second hand. In dark, stagnant air, each nod a sigh, and each sigh a sign of not yet, until it is. Until fortress doors are commanded open, setting forth charging boots, searing screams, bruising curses, and the only stirring felt in that cell for hours. Verily, with every difficulty comes ease. And a cool draught momentarily licks away beads of settled sweat as he's pulled and slammed face down again, with no regard whatsoever for the rhythm of that second hand. Cold, crushing handcuffs peer straight to the bone, officially. Shut the fuck up, motherfucker! Shut your fucking mouth now! Officially. All he asked was why they had to send him to Greece. Like lifeless chattel devoid of any form at all, he's thrown onto the floor below, hauled from there and torn out of this space he'd known. He'd cried through this, or so I'm told. Dared to state he didn't need this, didn't want to go to Greece, but would rather just have someone help. The officials, officially, never heard anything, showed no official interest or any other kind and led him away with no regard whatsoever for the rhythm of that second hand, which simply just carried on. Handcuffed in the car to Heathrow, pleads and begs and cries all quickly quenched. You haven't any right to say anything. Your need to speak is not your right. Your silence now is not your right. Your questions, fears, this panicked will to clear yourself is not your right. Airports are just a vast attempt to manage a plague of the world's travellers, foreigners, passengers and all others from somewhere else. Anyone basically who dared to move. It's fine if you do it to ski, less so if you do it to live. Perhaps it's to avoid confusing ourselves, to avoid shattering every mass-consumed illusion which allows us to do what we do like pre-programmed post-humans belligerently aware that should the processes of human thought and thinking be reawakened, none of this would make sense. None of us would make sense. And so, hiding themselves in the crevices, they lead the detained onto shadowed, secret routes, handcuffed, so all can know he hasn't earned the right to go where his feet lead, to follow the vision his sight affords. Unlike, of course, the skiers, the fleers, the cheap holidayers, the backpackers, gap trackers, experienced receivers, the lunchers in suits who discern over croots, how nations are bled to give life to the fewest. As earth ejects everyone equally and like airbound gypsies, the plane soars on, the handcuffs are taken off and his hands are released. I can see the logic. If his crime is stealing earth to stand upon, then there's no cause for concern up here. It's strange to think what he was fighting to stay in was nothing more than a prison cell. A centre for the detained, punishing those with no homes. Lacerated feet so they dare not stand again. Exasperated breaths so they daren't inhale again. Or so you'd think. Had his breath continued in time with the second hand, then 8am, like every other 8am, his door would have opened, letting in the only trace of air some breeze, some movement that isn't a heart bashing its head against its chest until 8.45 when breakfast would have been served. Though 8.45 is probably when his eyes would have stirred, cooled as they were by the relief of the morning, dawning at the call of an officer. Besides, there were only so many eggs a boy can eat every day. At 8.45, he would have walked the yard, talking to people just enough to feel their presence, avoiding them just enough to escape their pressures. The same thought echoes how and when they are going to leave. Watch Haitian tell the guy with no shoes how he read you. Can bail yourself out with just one pound. At 11 a.m., he'd go back to his room, one whole hour before lockup. The undiscerning eye would probably miss the independence ringing through this. Until one... You bide your time. 1.30, you lunch. At 2, everyone is out again. 
Stick to the people you know. Of course, stick to the people who know. Of course, stick to the people who haven't yet lost their minds. What do you mean there's no money on it? We have our rights, you know. We have our rights. I need a statement, a, a full printout statement. Are you listening? You all think we're, we're, we're a piece of shit, don't you? Don't you? All of you think we are a piece of shit because we are not from here. Huh? Because we are not from here, huh? Because we're not from Britain. Because we're foreigners. Well, you're not. You're not going to put my life at risk, economically or politically. Do you understand? You're not. My life is an achievement and you're not going to turn me into a criminal. I've been obeying law here for 17 years. That's Hashem. There's no one who walks with him anymore. At 7 p.m., dinner. 8, shower. 8.45, the door slams shut on them again. And each one of them pretends to be asleep while each one looks through one eye. Regulating breath with the second hand as though trying to learn how it's done again. And yet this seemed worth fighting for. Maybe he just wanted to stay still. Maybe because he wanted to breathe a little, get used to breathing a little, perhaps find his old rhythm again. A local man, a caring, kind, colossal man with colossal hands and eyes and mouth and size called Jim, would heave through those fortified gates with heaps of clothes and smiles. Someone who dared to look at him for longer than most looks had been. Spoke to ask not where he's from, why he's here, but how he is, who he is. Jim was the first. The first one to show this young boy that he cared. Assure him that there's someone out there. Assure him that there's someone there. Encourage him, empower him, fight for this young man. That was Jim, this young child of 14 years who'd walked from Afghanistan entering into Pakistan, lorry smuggled him into Iran, climbed mountains, deserts, cities, and the first man in months over half this earth, the first who asked him how he was, was this man named Jim. That's probably why he fights to stay somewhere, to be someone colossal enough to show he cared. The sign for seatbelt lit. His wrists half crippled, half formed, half human as handcuffs clicked. His first point of entry into the EU, Greece, is where he would be returned to, apparently. It's nothing more than that game where pinballs slowly go, only to be struck again somewhere, anywhere, away. The Greek police were waiting at the airport, ready. The British police less handed him over, more dumped him. It all been done before, well-trodden rights. Taken by the new uniform hosts into a quiet corner, they beat him. Why, he asked, why do you beat me? No place for questions this, they just did. From the airport, a small prison where no one speaks. No officer, no official, no one to help, no one to guide and tell you. He tried to call Jim, but couldn't get through. And then a letter. Greece issues him one month to have to leave. And so it all begins again. Hoping this time might be more successful, he sleeps in parks and finds a job picking olives, preparing for yet another exodus, another odyssey relived. Hiding at the harbour with all other refugees where every hour lorries are sought to be climbed under, like human swarms pushing and jostling, each one desperate in their quest to keep moving. In the shadows, amidst the crevices, just desperate to keep on moving. If you have money, you can skip the queue, enterprise. Like a weed takes root in every sinking pit, this is Europe after all. Otherwise, mind the police and the dogs who beat you for entering and beat you for leaving. Arms and legs left broken like a game children play, plucking wings off fleas and daring them to fly again. Finding a lorry, he held on. No seats on the undercarriage. Like the rest of his tail, it's not really designed for humans. And so he just held on. From Greece to Italy, a full 12 hours, this 14 year old held on with all his strength, Herculean, 
with all his power to simply keep moving, to simply not to be seen. But even Hercules would fail and so he did momentarily as his legs scraped across the surface of an earth that didn't want him. Arriving in a village in Italy, he sought out Rome, not for the beauty or the art, but simply because there'd been other refugees who'd looked like him, whose darker hues could shade him. For just enough time for his legs to be able to hold off again, this time the promised land was Scandinavia, its clean streets. Kind people had been whispered about like myth. You'll never know if you don't go. Italy, France, Holland, Germany, hiding under seats in trains, sleeping under bushes in parks, staying well within the shadows. The shadows stretched over half a continent. Not until Germany did the first crack of light expose him, unveil him, to the sight of yet another uniformed official from officialdom, handcuffed again. In court the next day, he understood nothing, except that he was driven to prison. 14 years of age attempting to find a way of being in a prison made for men? What's he doing here? What are you doing here? Don't you speak the language? He doesn't speak the language. How old is he? Too young is how old? Oi, you're too young. Too young to be here with us. Far too young. Too young. This is prison for men. What are you doing here? He needs a lawyer. Do you have a lawyer? This isn't human rights. It took prisoners to claim his human rights, his being human. It took prisoners to do that? It took prisoners to rally around him and find him a lawyer. It took prisoners to pay his fees so a letter could be written. Another court, another judge. The same stock solution grasped at blindly because no one dare take off their blindfolds. Send him to Greece. Another 3 a.m. came. Another flight, another pleading. This time by the police, to a pilot who refused to play the games of officialdom. Perhaps with his view of earth, he'd recognize the illusion of borders. The next time he was ripped out of his cell and taken to court, he didn't even know he was made free. Until his lawyers started to cry and boarded him onto a train for a refugee camp in Brushenwig from where he was told to move on to Oldenburg. He doesn't know why. It wasn't for him to ask questions, he just did. If he's being allowed to live, he just will. There was a church in that camp and a woman who'd clean it every day. This is the tale of where humanity hides. In a prisoner's wail, in a lawyer's tear, in a pilot's view of the world, in a woman's view of God in a child who took him in, embraced and gave him new life. Someone to take care of him and fight for his rights. Someone to finally show that while we're content to send them to death, there are some amongst us who harbour life.